series. Uh, the first one, we talked about the dry electrodes and the bring them into the real world and virtual reality. The second one, we introduced the multimodal sensing, uh, cardiac sensing, EMG, ECG, and how those can be synchronized. In today's topic, we're going to talk uh, again about um, how to collect data with EEG and other sensors. We're going to focus on motion capture uh, and eye tracking today. Uh, and this uh, recording, uh, this um, webinar is, will, is being recorded, uh, and it's uh, you know free, will be made available on YouTube along with the other webinars if you've missed the previous one. All right, uh, my uh, co-presenter today is uh, Mr. Benoit Gossin from TA Ergo. Uh, we're going to be featuring some of their technologies, and he'll tell us a little bit about those. Uh, Cameron is our host, uh, so if you have any questions please put them in the Q&A. He'll uh, try to answer them uh, in there. And uh, some of the answer, if there's any questions that need to take us up immediately, he'll interrupt us. Uh, otherwise, we'll answer some of the, all your questions at the end. And of course, if there's anything immediate, feel free to use the chat function as well. Uh, so that said, uh, we're going to uh, get started. Uh, so thank you again all for joining us. And um, Welcome to capturing the artifact-free dry EEG motion and eye tracking in the real world. So for um, those of you who uh, don't know us, we are wearable sensing. And we've been revolutionizing brain monitoring. We brought about uh, breakthrough dry electrode EEG technology a couple of years ago uh, to the market. We've been uh, su supporting uh, many of you um, and your colleagues to do research monitoring the brain in the real world. And really, some of you guys have been developing fantastic applications. Um, and today, we're going to talk also about how you can track the body as well uh, in the real world, and combination also how you can uh, track uh, the, uh, where you're looking, so gaze or eye tracking. We'll start with the brain. Uh, there are many ways to measure brain activity. Um, many of you are familiar with fMRI, PET scanning, and MEG. Those are methods that require large equipment and shielded environments or radio injections and are not quite practical to do in the real world. There are a few um, ambulatory technologies, such as uh, functional near-infrared and implanted electrodes. Um, but uh, you know, a functional infrared is sensitive to light, so you have to protect this uh, the light uh, from coming in. And the implanted arrays are still a little bit uh, intrusive and not everybody is ready for this. So that leaves us with EEG. And uh, if we compare those methodologies in terms of people usually look at um, the spatial resolution of the signals and the temporal resolution, um, but when you, and those are good aspects to look at scientifically, but when you go outside the lab, you have to also consider ease of use, availability, robustness to artifacts, portability, and cost effectiveness. When we look at all those features, we can see that EEG and FNIR have uh, great values added to them. Uh, today, we'll talk about EEG. We'll have a separate webinar where we'll talk about the integration of EEG with NIRs uh, in the real world. So what is EEG? EEG is a measure of the electrical activity of the brain uh, from the surface of the scalp. So when enough neurons that are close together fire together, we can see their postsynaptic potentials create local field potentials that spread through the brain, across the skull, and to the skin, and we can uh, record them there. The way we do that is we rub a layer of um, dead skin and uh, oils off the skin. We put the electrodes that look like these uh, cuff electrodes that you see here. And we, through the hole, we inject some gel. That gel goes through the little cracks that we made in the skin and makes a good uh, low contact, uh, low impedance contact that allows uh, these very, very tiny EEG signals to go through to the uh, amplifiers. On the right side, you're seeing some uh, traces of EEG. Uh, this is what EEG, some sample of what EEG looks like in different cognitive states. So aroused, the person is alert, paying attention, is what their EEG would look like. When they relax or they start to get drowsy, you see these spindles of oscillation. Those are called alpha waves. When they start to fall asleep, you see different types of spindles at a higher frequency and in different complexes. And when they go into deep sleep, you see um, delta wave patterns. Uh, so you can see just by looking at the morphology of the signal, we can tell something about the cognitive state. But typically to analyze EEG, 
we tend to look at uh, the signals in the Fourier domain. So we break the EG data into uh, power bands. We get the names uh, based upon their frequency. So between zero and four is delta, four to eight is theta, alpha is eight to 12, et cetera. And that allows us to analyze the, the data based upon the function of the underlying areas, which brain areas is being activated, what type of activity is happening there. That gives us some insight. I'll talk a little bit about how we analyze that in a second. So what are some of the current limitations of EEG? Well, at first is most people don't like to have their scalp abraded and putting gel in there. It just makes it not practical to do in large settings and mass screenings or fast settings or uh, on a daily use. It just becomes irritating to the skin. Also, EEG is typically uh, seen as sensitive to motion and electrical artifacts. Uh, so as you move, you, get, you pick up a lot of artifacts in the world. Uh, it also requires some kind of synchronization to get some context information to know what is going on when you see uh, when this brain activity is happening. Also, typically, it hasn't been portable, it hasn't been ambulatory, and therefore, it hasn't been practical to take outside of the lab into the real or virtual world. So this is the challenge that we set out to change, and um, this is uh, the, the, the headset that um, we've developed. So on the bottom right, you're going to see uh, dawning. Uh, that is happening uh, that was recorded previously and you'll see this, uh, this person with long hair having a headset put on her. During that time I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology. So we had uh, we were given a mission uh, by initially by DARPA and later by NIH and NSF and the Army and the Air Force and all sorts of funding agencies in the United States to develop a dry electrode. So we developed an ultra-high impedance amplifier uh, with a different set of circuits, unique circuitry, and we put some uh, silver-silver chloride pins that allows it to go through hair, and we were able to collect some data. So we spent quite some time validating the signals. Uh, the sponsors wanted to make sure that we had signal quality that matched uh, what was conventional EEG was giving, what the EEG was giving. So you can see on the bottom left some traces of alpha activity recorded you can see in red the dry electrode the EEG and in blue the um, wet electrode and you can see the morphologies match really well. So you can see the, we get usually better than 90% correlations between the signals and that's a really nice clean signal we're getting. Then the sponsor said, well, but the EEG has a lot of artifacts. How do you deal with that? And that's true. And because we have a dry electrode, we have a very high contact uh, impedance which would usually make the system not work and pick up a lot of artifacts. So we did a number of electrical and mechanical designs. Uh, we put uh, some springs behind the electrode to protect the headset, uh, the sensors from uh, motion. If the headset was to move, the electrode would stay put, as you can see in this little video. Uh, and uh, the, um, the, uh, there was a spring, that, that's the function of the spring here. And we put the amplifier immediately behind the electrodes and we encased everything inside the Faraday cage. The Faraday cage is a shield that protects us from electromagnetic interference. So now the only place the signal could come from is inside the head. It's amplified before it goes out to the EEG headset. So with that, we were able to get some really good uh, signals and we'll show you some of those in a second. Uh, and then we started spending a lot of time designing a headset that could be easy to use fast to put on and comfortable to use. Because once you have a dry electrode, the reason why you're doing a dry electrode is to be able to do practical recordings. And it's critical to have something that could be easy to use and comfortable to use. And of course, all of that needs to be ambulatory, meaning we have to be able to get up and walk in the world. And so we've implemented some wireless data acquisition and Bluetooth. So now what you see is uh, the, the person uh, here is uh, myself putting the headset on. I'm working the sensors through the hair of uh, the subject with this tool, and now I finished doing that, and this took about three minutes to do. So next, we'll show you the signal quality from uh, this person. So this is, um, uh, she's sitting down with her eyes open, and for those of you who are not familiar with EEG, this is what a blink would look like. Um, and you can see the, the rest of the EEG uh, traces. So the front signals are on top, which is why you'll see the blinks. Now she'll blink three times in a row so that those are showing up in the front channels. And uh, next she will bite her teeth a few times and that will produce an EMG artifact. So there's the EMG, it's high frequency. 
and it spreads from the jaw muscles to all the electrodes in the head. It's a very large amplitude signal. Next, uh, she will close her eyes. And you'll see uh, this is the artifact of the eyes closing. And next, you see generation of alpha activity. This is um, a type of activity that the brain generates when you close your eyes. This is synchronization of the default mode network to generate these uh, patterns of activity. Next, I'm going to uh, step behind her and set my foot on the floor. So this red channel is showing the electrical artifact being picked up on her body, but notice it's nowhere seen in the EEG channel. Next, she will tap her foot on the floor. And so you can see this very large artifact again, and, and you don't see it in most of the EEG channels. There's nothing there. Now I'm going to remove the um, low-pass filter. Um, and she'll put her foot on an electrical cable that's shielded uh, with rubber, but you can see a huge amount of uh, 60 hertz pickup uh, on the thread channel, which is picking up the noise on her body, but nothing is happening in the EG. Now, please note there's no artifacts removal algorithms here. This is just the mechanical and electrical um, designs that I told you about a little bit earlier. Now she is walking, and so you can see every time she steps, you can see in red are her footsteps, uh, the artifacts from her footsteps are she producing big triboelectric discharges on her body. And again, you don't see anything of that in the EEG signal. So it's a nice, clean EEG signal while she's walking. She's moving her arms, and you see it's quite clean signal unaffected by her movement. All right, so this was a critical part to be able to do EEG in the real world. And... Um, to summarize, oops. okay. So to summarize what I just told you, we developed a high fidelity sensor, a dry electrode EEG that could go to hair, produce the high signal quality, is artifact resistant. It is easy to set up, fast, and comfortable to wear all time, and it's wireless and amber free. We have a number of different headsets that uh, we can use in daily life or during sleep, and we also can integrate them into virtual reality headsets. So that's the hardware we built to collect this data. Next, I'm going to briefly tell you about uh, an algorithm that we developed to produce cognitive gauges from this uh, EG data. So we take the EG data, and rather than just giving raw data, we can also process it and get some features out of it. We have, uh, we can take data from EEG, EMG, GSR, skin temperature, respiration, FNIR, all of those get fed into a machine learning algorithm that extracts a number of features and can train individual or normative models. It trains very quickly and we can train it on a wide range of tasks. So here I'm going to show you a small video uh, of this person doing some math problem and there's their EEG data, and now you see uh, there are a few different gauges that are created. The first one here that's high is um, mental workload, um, and uh, sorry, that's engagement, and you can see this person is paying attention to his back. So he's engaged, he's attentive, and he's getting things correctly. Uh, the next two bars, uh, those are mental workload, uh, and you can see they're low because he's kind of solving these problems very quickly. It's not a difficult problem for him to solve. Uh, next, the problem is, is going to get pretty hard. Uh, you can see his attention drops for a little bit, and then he starts to concentrate again, uh, and starts to think a little harder, and it takes him about nine seconds, and he gets it incorrect. Uh, now he's paying more attention again, and his workload is high, and you will see that uh, he'll get it correctly in a few seconds. So we can monitor that, and we can look at the time course uh, over time, and you can see uh, we can we have um, we have uh, three low-level um, uh, EEG follow. Uh, so sorry, on the y-axis is how the mental workload output, and on the x-axis is time. Uh, so we can see um, easy, easy, easy problems followed by hard, hard problems followed by easy, easy, easy problems, hard, hard. So you can see that the mental workload is tracking the task difficulty. So as the task gets harder, mental workload goes up, and this is just derived from the EEG measures. So we're going to be using this type of model in a little bit. We have an example to illustrate to you guys, um, but we wanted to explain to you how these models work. We'll also have a separate webinar in the near future that goes 
into a lot more detail about how these gauges work and how to use them in different contexts and different uh, validations that we've done uh, to demonstrate how well these things work. All right, at this point, I'm going to um, pass the uh, presentation on to um, Benoit, who will tell you a little bit about how we integrate the EG data with um, uh, the multimodal suite and specifically with IMUs for motion tracking and wearable um, glasses. So Benoit, to you. Yeah, thank you, Walid. Um, so let me just share my screen. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna basically, as uh, Walid said, just present to you how we did for this experience, just gather the data and how we did run the analysis. So really, a quick introduction of what we've been doing as a company as TA. We've been developing for almost thirty years now. Um, a platform basically that is dedicated to um, for the measurement analysis of human behavior when it's environment. So there are two parts of this. The, on the one side, you have a software platforms or captive to um, gather the information, record them, run the analysis, and just um, analyze the data and export them. And on the other hand, you'll have a full suite of uh, sensors, uh, including our sensor that we uh, manufacture and develop especially for captive and a third party uh, sensor that are compatible, such as for instance, uh, the EEG with the DSI from Rebel sensor. So to go really quick on the on all the possibilities that we have with our um, really versatile suite of sensor, we divide them in three types or three families. The first one, the physiological parameters, for instance, temperature or ECG, um, then the effort one, so more focused on how to gather signal uh, related to efforts such as EMG, load cell, or FSR. And last but not least, the posture with some accelerometer, inclinometer, and uh, IMUs. And in our example, this is the this last sensor that the IMUs that we use. So IMUs stand for um, inertial motion unit. So that's a small piece of tech, a really uh, advanced piece of tech with. Uh, 3D magnetometer, uh, 3D um, gyroscope, and also um, an accelerometer in it. And it will gather all this uh, data and with a fusion, it's going to merge data and then make all the listed avail measurements available, such as angle, angular speed, acceleration, uh, steps number as well, and also distance walked. And obviously all the raw data are available. And as a result, you might have uh, something like this. Um, like this avatar, which is a 3D model um, of, of a person wearing the IMUs. And here you can see a colorization of the joints according to threshold. It could either be ergonomic standards or threshold that you modify for the sake of your, uh, for the sake of your study. Since this is some wearable sensors, no infrared camera is needed or no markers needed, which leads to a very quick uh, setup time. And also you can go pretty much everywhere with, uh, with those sensor especially because they are um, really unmatched, they have a really unmatched immunity to magnetic disturbances, which make them perfectly suited, uh, suitable for a uh, changing environment. The other piece uh, of technology we used um, on top of EEG and IMUs were the eye tracking. So basically the nutshell eye tracking are some smart cameras, so advanced cameras filming what a person sees in the field of view, but also just monitor the eye gaze to then have an overlay of the eye gaze on what the person sees. Uh, so we listed here three examples of uh, really popular eye tracking, and um, we use the Pupil Labs one uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, case study. So that was the hardware part. Uh, now for the software. So basically in the software, we have different types of input. So the video footage, then a uh, task analysis module to basically do a breakdown of what happened during the experiment and just to um, have a better vision and a timeline of what happened. And um, also all the data coming from the wearable sensor. So here, IMU, EEG, and eye tracker. And the goal of captive software is just to synchronize every, every type of input that are listed here and um, to just put them in one place. So it's easier to 
display on, on, on the one hand than to analyze them because um, the software is not only a display tool but also have um, a lot of powerful analytics tool uh, embedded. And uh, last but not least, to um, create some reports, export the data, also stream them to uh, third party um, software, also virtual reality environment, for instance. Um, I'm just going to go quickly on this, um, just to keep the webinar in time, but the software also has a lot of specific analysis, um, posture analysis, muscular one, uh, heart rate analysis, as well as uh, arousal analysis, and all of these are immediately available as soon as you use uh, the dedicated uh, sensor, obviously, um, so the one that are written um, in the brackets, so for instance, uh, for a uh, posture analysis, you will need the uh, I need that. So, for this experiment, um, in terms of donning uh, of the sensors, so the motion sensors, um, you can see them, you just have to strap them on the body. So this is a procedure that is um, extremely quick. So no, uh, no uh, special markers or special environment is needed. Um, basically, you can put this, the, the motion sensor wherever you want on, it, on each segment of the body. So on the arm, on the forearm, which makes that also really uh, compatible with uh, personal protection equipment, for instance, or, uh, or EEG or heart rate bail, for instance. So this is, uh, as you can see, quite quick. Uh, and then the, the, while you're done with the sensor, uh, you have the initialization phase, which is just basically setting it up. Uh, and saying okay to make sure that the avatar that you're getting is an accurate uh, is an accurate reproduction of what's happening in in, in real time in, in the reality as you can see here on the screen. Um, also, you you can uh, parameter the different uh, uh, joint correlation thresholds, um, and then so you have the eye tracking setup, and also the specific specificity of the pupil lab one is that you don't need any calibration whatsoever. So once you plug it in a, here in a smartphone that will act as a data logger to just record the data um, while the person is driving, uh, there is nothing else uh, to do. And this, was, uh, this will allow us to see what the person is actually looking at. For instance, here with a red circle, it is the area to which the, the, uh, the person is, is looking at. So that's basically it. Uh, for the donning and everything, so, uh, uh, um, an experiment like the one we, we run was about uh, between 15 and uh, 20 and 30 minutes, which is uh, really, um, really quick. So basically now the setup and the case setting itself, we asked the driver to uh, go from point A to point B in a familiar environment, meaning he knew the area, but it wasn't uh, his traditional commute uh, way. So he couldn't engage his uh, autopilot mode uh, as to speak. And um, so you can see here that I recorded on the left, uh, on the left part of the of the screen in, in the captive software, you have the 3D model that uh, just shows uh, the positions of, of the arms um, and the movement done while driving. And on the and on the left part here, um, you can see the small uh, the small red dot going uh, going pretty much everywhere, and is the gaze overlay that we can uh, that we had from the from the eye tracking. And on the on the right part uh, of the on the right half of the screen, you see all in sync all the different types of data with here the workload and the engagement, here the gaze, um, and then the and then the um, the gaze analysis. So here looking at road sign dashboard, etc. And um, and basically all the data that you want, you can display them. Uh, for instance, we could have added here uh, the IMU's data or the neck rotation, uh, for instance. We didn't do that, but that's totally doable, and everything is customizable. So from this, we decided to show you really a couple, uh, a couple of uh, examples of the, the metrics that we could get, which is really the top of the iceberg, but we have to, to uh, keep it short uh, for this uh, webinar. So basically, we looked at um, the cognitive metrics uh, in regards to the driving complexity. So as, um, as what it explained, we trained two models, a workload model and an engagement model. And basically, the takeaway here is the workload, so in blue, increases with task complexity, which is logic. But then here you have actual figures to 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 corroborate your um, to to corroborate your, your your findings, basically. Also, uh, we have the same task, so driving complexity. But here we analyze uh, the gaze, and what we can see is the higher the task complexity, the less the driver's gaze in on the road. So this could be seen here when when the load when the 
the task is not really complex. The driver is looking at more than 60% of the time on the road, but when there is a high complexity, he's looking, um, he's looking only 45% of the road. So there is a decrease of 15 points. Um, so for instance, also in terms of uh, GPS, so we activate the GPS during the, during the trip. Um, driving with the GPS, as you can see, added an, uh, an extra 16% workload. Also, something that was really uh, great for us, even though it was totally not planned, it is that the driver encountered some roadworks uh, one, while we we're running the experiments uh, and uh, recording the data. So basically, he had to find an alternative way, which was a really great exercise for us in terms of workload engagement. And what we just noticed is that multitasking, which is either by adjusting the GPS and putting in new information or finding the alternative way, the traditional, uh, the traditional way by looking at road signs. Um, multi multitasking increases dramatically the workload. So we are going from 40%, um, a bit less than 40% to over 90%. So that's, that's a, a great increase. Um, also, so always in this past finding, we um, once again analyze the gaze. Um, so first thing that we can you can see here is the driver eyes are more on the road when the GPS is off. So as you can see here, with the GPS, it's uh, it's about, it's about fifty percent of the time. Where without the GPS, just driving normally, it is about seventy percent. Second finding is the driver is more distracted from the road when when setting up the GPS. Here you can see. Um, almost 50% of the time while he was adjusting the GPS, he did look at the GPS itself. So that's all the, that all this time he couldn't look at the road. Um, last but not least, we can see here on the right of the screen the, this big um, yellow uh, yellow chart, which is um, basically when he was when the driver was lost, he was just looking um, uh, almost 70, 65% uh, of the time to road signs. So when he was listening, he was looking for new information to, um, to just drive to its, uh, to its objective. So that's just a, a typical example of cognitive and eye tracking results we can get. Also, since, since we had, as you could see before, uh, some IMUs on, we can see here um, that a driving posture, like the 1010, meaning the both hands on the top of the steering wheel, might be the one that is considered the safest or the one you could be taught with, but um, it could be not really comfortable for the shoulders, for instance. And those analysis, if you want to go deeper into it, for instance, the neck, um, the neck rotation are acceptable with a few extreme rotation because most of the time we stay in, in, the, in the acceptable area, which is the, red, the, the, the green one. But they wanted to see in which occurrences, which uh, instances the driver was doing extreme rotation. And with all the, capacity, the capabilities and the analytics that the software has, we could see that extra rotation of the neck happened when the, the driver was either looking at the road or checking, uh, checking side mirrors. And by reviewing the video at the special instances, we also looked at uh, he, um, it was also in roundabout and when it was changing lane that it was during the rotation. So that's really the kind of, uh, the, the kind of uh, result that we can get. Um, for a quick experiments, once again, it's the top of the iceberg. So there are many, many more metrics that we have shown you. And um, last but not least, before I give the floor back to Wally to do a, a few key takeaways, this whole experiment uh, was really quick to do. So to equip the person and to drive. So basically from A to Z, it lasted two hours with a 45 minutes recording session. So you can see that the setting up process and also cleaning and everything because of COVID was really quick. Uh, and to do all the data, all the statistics, picking up the metric that was um, meaningful for this webinar, um, everything uh, lasted, uh, took us almost half a day. So that's something that is, once again, really quick with processing time that are um, really handy when it comes to have insightful metrics um, quickly and for, for every kind of experiment, basically. So this is from my side. Um, well, like, um, Walid, I'm just uh, letting you uh, present again, so you can uh, um, so you can just sum it up and end this webinar after uh, before the Q and A session. Walid, you're muted. Yeah. Thank you, Benoit. I'm just going to uh, jump to uh, the next slide. Okay. 
So what um, what Benoit has showed you here and um, and the results is a really nice uh, way to show the value of combining these data. So you could have a contacts information from the e from the eye tracker and the IMUs give you some insight as to what is happening um, at the time when you're looking at the cognitive state. So you can see the relationship between increased workload and uh, their eye tracking and, and what they're looking at. And that is really the value of combining these modalities together. So the last slide here, I just want to discuss briefly what are some example other applications that people, um, you know, some of our users and you, and you uh, might be looking at. Some people are studying uh, cognitive psychology, want to understand behaviors uh, either between the person and their environment or between people and each other. So they want to track people's hands, they want to look at the, where are they looking, are they looking at the face, are they looking at the hands, how do people interact. Those are types of questions psychologists want to ask in real world settings. Uh, Neuroergonomics, we want to know uh, whether a particular user interface or um, program or in, uh, whatever it may be, how hard is it for a person? How is it affecting their mental performance? How is their physical performance affecting their cognitive states? Are they, uh, is physical exercise tiring their brains? Neuromarketers want to see how uh, the uh, things you're looking at are engaging your attention. Are you enjoying what you're seeing? Are you going to remember it? Are you going to want to buy it? Uh, those are some of the questions they want to have, this visual simultaneous data along with the uh, uh, cognitive states. Neurorehabilitation, our uh, researchers are looking to understand gait, dexterity, hand movements, uh, and attention of people and, and their brains. How What's happening inside your brain as you had an injury or neuro or neurodegenerative disease, and when you're trying to recover from that, how's your brain and how's your behavior interacting? Uh, sports scientists want to study the biomechanics, but they also want to understand the cognitive loads that are happening, how is focus, what's the relation between focus and the body, the positions, and uh, they want to use this information to train for peak performance training, you know, where to look at, how to focus, how to breathe, all these kinds of measures are, are useful for them. Of course, also biomarkers, so people might be interested in looking for autism biomarkers, for example, and want to know eye movements and how eye movements are related and where are they looking, do they look in the face, so they avoid face, facial contact, uh, and what, what do they behave like and what's happening in their EG. So those are just some examples that I've uh, listed here of some of the advantages of having this kind of multimodal sensing. So last, I just want to summarize for you guys what we told you today. Uh, if you leave here and you remember that you can collect high signal quality for both EEG, movement signals, and eye tracking, that this is easy to do, fast, comfortable, and uh, with Captive, the analysis is seamless. The syn synchronization is done for you by the software. The analysis down to report, you know, the features that are built into them and the reports that are generated at the end are, are quite um, flexible and um, fast to implement. And with the QState software, you can get some insights from the EEG and some of the physiological features into what's happening cognitively in the person using some machine learning algorithms. So that's what we presented to you today. Uh, we hope uh, this was useful and informative. Uh, so the next webinar and the series will uh, cover again a little bit of uh, dry EG with eye tracking, but this time with an emphasis on remote uh, desktop-based um, sensors and looking for researchers, uh, research applications of that and neural marketing. If you have any questions uh, about what we presented today or you'd like to have a little bit more in-depth uh, discussions with us, please don't hesitate to contact us at uh, Info at Wearable Sensing. Uh, or if you're interested in um, some of the Captiv uh, sensors, uh, you can contact uh, TA Ergo directly as well. Um, with that, uh, I look forward to answering uh, some of your questions and um, uh, supporting you guys' this research to uh, lead the world in innovation. Awesome. Like Wally said, if you guys have questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A. We've got a few that have come in so far. Uh, the first one is, is the cap for all skull sizes from infants to adults? Okay, a great question. So we do have a number of headsets that fit a wide range of, um, of sizes. So we have headsets that fit the children uh, from three years of age up to 14 years of age. And then we have another size that fits uh, um, a, broader, a broad range, I think, starting from nine years of age and above. Um, 
those are, um, you know, and we have different uh, variants of different headsets. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, what amps can the EEG cap interface with? Ah, so it's, it's a good question. So <clears throat> in actuality, <coughs> sorry about that. Very sorry about that. So the um, EEG headsets that you were seeing, <clears throat> those are complete EEG systems. Those contain the amplifiers in the headset, <clears throat> the digitizers are in the headset, the batteries in the headset. It's a complete EEG system that you're wearing on your head as you walk around the real world. So there's no need for any additional amplifiers to plug them into. Awesome. Uh, another question, what kind of cleaning and maintenance is required for the cap? Okay, thank you for that question. So typically uh, each cap comes provided with a power brush. Um, that's um, kind of like a makeup brush. It has a little wheel that spins pretty quickly. It comes with an alcohol container. You clean it with 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol. There's no need to sterilize the devices because there's no, we're not breaking the skin. Since you're not breaking the skin, uh, you're able to um, just abrade the, the, sorry, you're not abrading the skin, so you're, you don't have to sterilize um, and you can clean it with 70% IPA. Uh, it takes about a minute to clean uh, any of our headsets. Awesome, thank you. The next question is, is there a lot of noise, EEG noise, when playing baseball? Okay, uh, great question. So then the baseball uh, picture that you saw there, um, the researchers there were interested in the pre-pitch response. So uh, they wanted to know how focused the person is and what their brain state is before they pitch. Um, the headsets we've shown you are quite robust to motion artifacts, casual motion artifacts. So if you saw the person in the demo, she was walking around casually, moving her arms, that's fine. If you shake very fast or if you jump, you will generate a motion artifact. So it is a matter of how fast your head is moving and the change in momentum that will introduce some artifacts beyond the limits of what the headset uh, can deal with just uh, with a mechanical and electrical shielding. For such cases, you might need more advanced artifacts, removal algorithms. But what we showed you today was cases without needing that. And we're happy again to present some of the options for uh, advanced artifact removal uh, in, in kind of more extreme cases. Awesome. Thank you for that. Next question What artifact removal algorithms are being used on the EEG? Oh, okay, uh, quite uh, related to that. So um, in, in the EG that you saw, again, there was the only filters that were applied were one hertz to 40 hertz uh, filters. Those are standard low pass and high pass filters. There was no other artifact removal. Uh, we do have uh, some artifact removal in the QState software for blink removal. So that allows us to deal with blinks and remove the blinks. And if there is uh, artifacts that are very large, uh, then it just flags them and it doesn't use this data uh, at the moment. Awesome. Uh, next question is, um, can you provide more info about the amps and software, frequency range, sampling rate, options for filtering? Sure. And we're happy to have a, you know, our, our sales team uh, kind of follow up with you and, and kind of provide you spec sheets uh, and, and more information. We're sampling at 300 hertz or 600 hertz. Uh, the frequency range uh, is from 3 millihertz to 150 hertz. Um, and the software that's included is data acquisition software. It has some basic uh, low pass and high pass filters that can be applied. Beyond that, we interface with a wide range of third party software tools that can do a whole, all sorts of things. Uh, I get the sense this person is from the neurofeedback community, so uh, we do support a number of neurofeedback software and other third-party uh, data analysis software. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, how do you deal with clock drift for recordings between different devices? Can you send event markers? Yeah, so I guess I can take this one finally to... <laughs> To, to review well it um yeah so in the case of uh captive for instance um with this experiment there is no such problem because everything is done through captive so directly via the platform which means you only rely on one clock um so this is for the drift 
Um, and then for the for the for the triggers, you can also send, depending on your configuration, some external triggers. Uh, they can also be so um, analog triggers, just you know, regular electric impulsion, or also uh, digital triggers with a line of code that could be synchronized through um, with other software, basically, so in and out. Um, and also, the synchronization can be can can be done with uh, with other software as well. So those triggers can also events or triggers can also be used for the sake of uh, synchronization with all all other um, all the type of signals. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, another question: Does the eye tracking work in natural environments? How about with remote eye tracking? Yeah. So, um, okay, I'm taking this one. So the one that we use, uh, we use for this uh, case study. Obviously, it was natural environment because it wasn't a real car on a real road. So there is no there is no problem with that. Um, especially with a pupil lab that doesn't have any calibration, so it's even easier um, to get it out of the lab. Um, and for remote uh, eye tracker, so basically, because we, we haven't talked about this, but those are the one you put under a screen to just uh, put to do some eye tracking on a screen. So just desktop eye tracker as well, like we call that as well. Uh, it's totally compatible. Uh, that's the, exactly the same protocol. Uh, it's just just interface the eye tracker with captive uh, directly, and and you run it through. So nothing ends and uh, nothing changes. Sorry, but um, would compatible with both. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, next question is, there has been research concerning problems with Bluetooth connections for EEG. How have you resolved this? Sure. So we have a, a few things uh, that, that help us with this. So first, uh, as you saw in the demo, uh, when we took out the low pass uh, filter, you could see that the body can pick up uh, all sorts of electromagnetic interference. In the case uh, of what you saw was the 60 Hertz from the mains frequency which often software will just filter out. In the case of uh, Bluetooth, Bluetooth transmission is in the EG band, it's around 30 Hertz, uh, so that can cause interference. Um, so the shielding on our sensors protects us from that, from the uh, uneven distribution of the signals on the body. And then we have a sensor called the common mode follower that helps us deal with signals that are common on the entire body. So it's a combination of technologies uh, working in, in harmony that allow us to deal with uh, environmental artifacts and, and be kind of quite immune uh, to these uh, artifacts. So the other case of what Bluetooth could do is if you have a lot of Bluetooth devices in the environment, then that could interfere with Bluetooth transmission. Um, and for that, you know, you, we have a, a way to do the data streaming in a wired mode so that you can stream the data and not, not worry about the Bluetooth. Awesome. And then what looks like our last question for now is uh, what features and algorithm is the cognitive states classification using? Okay, thank you for that question. So um, the, there are over 20,000 features that, um, that the um, Q-States uh, algorithm extracts from the EEG data. Those uh, are power features, they have some coherence features, some phase features. Um, we do uh, tackle uh, all of those. We feed them into the partial least squared uh, machine learning algorithm. So that's an algorithm that uh, can look at the salient features and, and learn the differences between them uh, and then kind of create models based on those. Again, uh, like I said, we will have another webinar where we will go into a lot more depth uh, about Q-States, how it works, uh, how the uh, uh, algorithms and the features uh, kind of work together. Uh, what types of um, uh, insight you can get from this type of analysis and what kind of questions are useful for this type of analysis. We'll be happy to, uh, in the meantime, if, you, if you'd like, just send us a, an email and we'll be happy to talk with you individually and then answer any more questions. Awesome, so it looks like those are all of the questions that we have for now. Um, like Wally just mentioned, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to send them in to info wearable sensing or contact uh, TEA Ergo. Um, but for now, thank you guys for attending and appreciate all the questions. All right, everybody, thank you again for joining us and taking the time. And we look forward to seeing you at uh, our next webinars. And if you have requests for specific topics you'd like us to cover, please don't hesitate also to email us and let us know. 
thanks again and i wish you guys Thank a you. good evening or a good day bye-bye